um, Gillette Burgess is, according to this, that I will now read a few excerpts from, a truly remarkable Renaissance man. Um, he became a West Coast Bohemian who responded to the European decadent movement with nonsense poetry. He wrote essays and short stories about the nature of humor, the function of art, gender relations, and the basis of empathy, um, most or all of which are topics that we cover from time to time here at The Humanist. Um, Alfred himself is a practicing optometrist with an MA in philosophy, specializing, specializing in aesthetics. Um, he compiled a collection of um, Gillette Burgess's work called A Collection of Gillette Burgess's Works. No, called A Gillette Burgess Sampler, Ethics and Aesthetics in 2012 and has lectured several times actually about Burgess since. So here is Alfred. Thanks, Marion. Am I coming through on this? Okay. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about one of the most fascinating people I've ever come across, and that's Gillette Burgess. He lived from 1866 to 1951. I'll give, him, give you some background about where he came from. Um, he got in, um, was raised in Boston. He went to MIT he, as a civil engineer. His mother was on the board of the Unitarian Association in Boston. Then he came out with the railroad, came out west. He taught topographic drawing at Berkeley uh, in 1893 or so. Then he got fired by the administration because he tore down the statue of this teetotaling dentist named uh, Cogswell, Henry Cogswell, who erected all these statues of himself all over the Bay Area. So he tore it down because he thought it was ugly, probably egged on by drunken students as well. But the administration didn't take too kindly to that, so they fired him. Then he went across the Bay to San Francisco. He joined up with a bunch of artists and poets and, and uh, furniture designers to form this group called La Jeune, the young ones, including Ernest Picciotto, who was a painter, Bruce Porter, a stained glass designer, Willis Polk, the architect, and they put out this um, art magazine called The Lark, which was made out of bamboo fiber paper and it had all kinds of poetry and essays in it. Now, his main claim to fame, though, was he reacted against the decadent movement in Europe it was the late 19th century art and literary movement obsessed with art, sex, and death, and the pathological intersections of those. For instance, they didn't aspire for art imitating life, but, but death imitating art. Uh, their manifesto was Against Nature by Joris Carl Wismans, published in 1884. The hero or anti-hero of that book was a dissolute named Jean Dessant in Paris who decided to withdraw from uh, regular life and into his uh, mansion and all he did there was to classify everything according to aesthetics. So what he did was he listed all the objects in his place and classified them all aesthetically, uh, ranking them. Uh, operas, curtains, jewels, perfumes, books, artwork, um, everything that he could find. And in fact, he encrusted a tortoise, land tortoise, with jewels uh, encrusted on the shell. But unfortunately, the weight killed the tortoise, so that was unfortunate. Some other things he did was he would go out occasionally. He ran into a 15-year-old boy, struck up a conversation with him, and found out he was an abused uh, child. His parents abused him. So in order to assuage him a little bit, he paid a month worth of visits to a local brothel and said, here, go enjoy yourself. Uh, another interesting, funny incident was that he wanted to visit England to cross the channel. So he said, I think I'll go down and, and um, go to the port and take the boat across the channel. When he was there waiting, he
he met some or overheard some tourists coming back from England, them talking about it. And he said, gee, that's not so great. I, I've heard enough. So he goes home. <laughs> um, so part of that decadent movement was uh, Oscar Wilde in England. And I use his quote as an epigraph to my book that I compiled. He said, art should never try to be popular. The public should try to make itself artistic. In Germany, there was a writer named um, Hans Heinz Ewers, who was part of this movement, who wrote horror stories that commingled sex, art, and death. His most famous one that's been anthologized a lot is called The Spider. You can even Google that and hear someone on YouTube read it to you. But so make sure your uh, lights are on and uh, when, he, when you he listen to that. Um, the American writers who responded to the decadent movement uh, include Clark Ashton Smith on the West Coast and Todd Robbins on the East Coast, who wrote Spurs, who was made into the silent movie Freaks by Todd Browning, made up of circus freaks and what they did to, to these... Uh, um, well, I don't want to go into all that, but... <laughs> But it was a major movement that was reacted to by Americans as well. Now, Gillette Burgess also reacted against it, but he did it in a different way. He wanted to use nonsense humor to um, sort of um, not to bring down the seriousness of this movement. Um, in fact, his quote, his mission statement goes like this. The decadence, with its morbid personalities and a cursed analysis of exotic emotion, is over, please God. Yet we may adopt its methods and refine the simplicity of primary impulse, thus increasing the whole sum of pleasure with the delicate nuances that amplify waves of feeling. So nonsense poetry is the way he did that. And his main uh, claim to fame was called the Purple Cow. Have any of you ever heard of that? Yeah, that, that was his. It um, goes like this. I, I've, I've never seen a purple cow, and I never hope to see one. But I can tell you anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. Now, purple cows, of course, don't exist. That's part of the nonsense nature of that. Um, nonsense humor was um, kind of a lead-off into surrealist humor or Dada humor, you know, which, which is these modernist movements that came after romanticism and symbolism and decadence. It's a uh, tension between the meaning and lack of meaning, or made up of non sequiturs, contradictions, faulty cause and effect, bizarre juxtapositions. So the purpose of that is to have the audience question the established order. You know, to make, um, to criticize or get them to think about the prevailing situation, to, to use uh, nonsense to sort of a subversive way. Um, to get back to the Lark, though, there was 24 issues started in 1895 by Burgess and Bruce Porter, made out of bamboo fiber paper, had poems, cartoons, artwork, essays, and fiction. Now, one thing that it had, which resonates with me, is this piece, what he called, Interchangeable Philosophical Paragraphs. Since I have an MA in philosophy, I can relate to this. What he was doing here is to poke fun at analytic philosophy and how it can be very turgid. So these six propositions go like this. It, the first one is, it may be doubted that any system of thought arranged upon the lines herewith proposed can be a success. The fact of its accomplishment alone, important as it must be, is no proof of method. Number two, for instance, the correct relation between any two facts is one that must be investigated along the lines of thought most perfectly correlated to those facts. Number three, and in spite of what might at first sight be called irrelevancy, there is this to be observed, no matter what bearing the above may have upon the subject in hand, that the relations of one part to another may or may not be true. The fourth, and here must be noted the importance of the demand that such types of thought do exist, 
This is no doubt a quality of subjects rather than relativity between modes of expression. Number five, so too are questions affecting the expression of coherent symbols of equal importance with the method by which these symbols are expressed. And the last one, but at the same time, these must be a certain divergence in form between the types of questions to be discussed. He claims that these six propositions can be interchanged. So he's poking fun at analytic philosophy here. Now, the, the Lark was pretty pioneering because he um, had women contribute to it. Florence Lundberg was an artist. Carolyn Wells was a nonsense versifier and mystery writer who, who went on to write a lot of mysteries during the 1930s. Juliet Wilbur Tompkins was an artist as well. And women did not get the right to vote to 1920. So I think in the late 1800s, he was pretty forward thinking here. Now, regarding the purple cow, that limerick was parodied by so many people that he got kind of sick of it. So he wrote a sequel. Ah, uh, yes, I wrote the purple cow, and I'm sorry now I wrote it. But I can tell you anyhow, I'll kill you if you quote it. <laughs> So eventually, he thought the lark was not radical enough. So he, along with uh, Garnett Porter, um, did the, a, a trapezoidal-shaped magazine called Le Petit, Le Petit Journal de Refusé in 1896. That was a takeoff on the avant-garde show in Paris by the Impressionists called the Salon de Refusé. So he was doing a takeoff on that. It was one issue only, made a pad, pattern cast-off wallpaper trapezoidal, so, so it would not stand up like other magazines. Mm -hmm. It was inspired by the fad magazines of its day. There were many such magazines published in Europe and this country. Ostensible contact was included thrice rejected manuscripts penned by women, but they were really by him. And he gave the name of three magazines, some were imaginary and some were real, that, were, that rejected these so-called uh, articles. The cover figures were influenced by Audrey Beardsley, the Art Nouveau illustrator. The margins had weird designs, animal figures, elastic cartoons. And what I brought today was a facsimile of that. This is a facsimile of what it looked like. See, it's trapezoidal in shape, so it doesn't stand up with other magazines. And here's the issue of the lark. It was one of the issues. So his, uh, the um, nonsense stuff that he did, uh, I interpret as, and the, the magazine, the, the uh, trapezoidal magazine, stands at the interregnum between the end of romantic movements like the decadence, art nouveau, art for art's sake, aestheticism, and foreshadows later modernist movements like Dada, which was established in 1915 at the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich, and surrealism with their use of nonsense, non sequiturs, and absurdity against the established order which gave way to World War I between 1914 to 1918. So this is pre, it's like a preamble to that, although he used it for a different purpose. After he put this out, like many artists, he went to New York. And from there, he went to Paris. He wrote up the, um, the Salon de Independent show in 1910. He published an article about it called The Wild Men of Paris, the excerpt of which is in the book that I compiled, in the architectural record dated May 1910. It was the first review of the French avant-garde to be published in this country. And it raises... Uh, in, in, in the process of that, he gave his first impression of these Fauvist paintings. Now, if any of you know Matisse's work, his portraits of women were of primary colors. They weren't flesh or realistic colors. They were primary <coughs> blues, greens, reds. Uh, just didn't look realistic. So I'd like to read you the impression that he got of, uh, of um, these when he first saw those, 
And if someone who is a bohemian reacted this way, you can imagine what the man on the street would react. But the nudes, they look like flayed Martians, like pathological charts. Hideous old women patched with gruesome hues, lopsided, with arms like the arms of a swastika sprawling on vivid backgrounds, or frozen stiffly upright, glaring through misshapen eyes, with noses or fingers missing. They defied anatomy, physiology, almost geometry itself. They could be likened only to the lady of the limerick. And of course, he had to stick a limerick in this. There was a young girl of Lahore, the same shape behind as before, and as no one knew where to offer a chair, she had to sit down on the floor. <laughs> and he wrote in his, also before that, he said, I realized for the first time that my views on art needed a radical reconstruction. Suddenly I entered a new world, a universe of ugliness. But um, he did sympathize with them eventually. Um, when he talked about Cezanne's pioneering work, he talked about Matisse, who took the first step into the undiscovered land of the ugly. He had sympathy for Matisse, but less for his disciples, including, concluding his work was awfully alive. Then he interviewed the artists. From Matisse, he learned that the fauvism was rebellion against the subtleties of impressionism in favor of directness of pure color. Picasso was subjective, emotional, instinctive. Only joy of life could revel in such brutalities. He saw Picasso's 1907 breakthrough, proto-cubist painting, called La Demoiselle d'Avignon, which he painted after visiting a museum with African sculptures. Burgess concludes that these artists were not charlatans, despite being so shocked in the beginning. He believed their virile, ecstatic nature exemplified Nietzsche's definition of an ascendant, not stagnant, art, because it is the product of an overabundance of life and energy, not frozen into convention like the academic painters. This art stimulated thinking and a valuable function of art. So because Alfred Stieglitz read his article, he gave Picasso his first show in his 291 gallery in late 1911. He also gave Burgess a show in the same month. So Burgess also did artwork. In fact, he uh, wrote an article about his own work called Gillette, Bur Gillette Burgess Invents a New School of Art in the New York Times, David, November 6, 1911. Essays in Subjective Symbolism. He wanted his art to be subjective, suggestive, stimulating to the imagination, and does not care if they shock or amuse as long as they do not, do not bore people. His intention was to sweep one's ego from the firm ground of reality and reason, to fling the soul topsy-turvy into space and cause and effect where cause and effect do not apply. He admits being concerned with the idea rather than technical execution. He didn't try to imitate the art of his time, but tried to invent new art which satirized the avant-garde movements, and that he did. But before that, he did watercolors from 1894. They were starkly whimsical, even nightmarish. And he used simplified versions in the Lark as um, reproduced artwork. I brought a copy of, uh, of one of those which was in a uh, collection of works that he gave to his partner uh, uh, in crime, Bruce Porter. My feet are so brittle they break off in bed, and my caramel pillow, it sticks to my head. <laughs> you can look at this later if you want. So he did the watercolor artwork and also did the uh, text along with it. He also drew a comic strip called Goops from 1924 to 1925. And the goops are bowling ball shaped head children, which he also illustrated and wrote limericks. They were manuals for the proper behavior of kids, uh, proper comportment. So here he's warning against kids running in front of horses. The goops, they are too soft to hurt when they're run over in the dirt, but you have little bones that break and little arms and legs to ache. 
so I shall listen for your screams if I catch you behind the teams. <laughs> he wrote a whole bunch of books that, that have these goops in them. He wrote a comic strip that was published in newspapers as well. And the goops su survive to this day. There's even a website called Goops Unlimited. And it's put out by this uh, corporation, a foundation that awards authors of children's books, the best children's book of the year, they give this Goops Award to. So the, the Goops actually survive. He also had a nonsense dictionary, and the word blurb appears in nonsense dictionary, and that word survives. Um, also contributions to pop culture. He published a short story called The Ghost Extinguisher in Cosmopolitan in April 1905, which anticipates the movie Ghostbusters from 1984. I don't know if Harold Ramis and Dan Aykroyd read his story, but if they did, they didn't credit him. They even have details like using a vacuum cleaner to vacuum up the ghosts and storing them in bottles. You know, they, he did that in his story as well. So it's amazing. So that summarizes some of the aesthetics aspect of it. Now I'll get into the, um, the, the uh, ethical aspects of Burgess. His main treatise on ethics is called Have You an Educated Heart, published in 1924, which I uh, reprinted fully in the book. He starts out with talking about style and gift giving. He calls styles a combination of taste and imagination, good taste and imagination. An educated heart knows what the recipient wants or makes the effort to know, to remember, or to find out. Giving is an art. For example, a friend is going to visit a foreign country. Instead of giving a basket of fruit, how about a purse with some currency of that country ready to use upon arrival? He talks about, or against, half giving. He says the educated heart avoids this. It stops part way on the road to kindness with a goal plainly in sight. For example, inviting a friend to dinner but forgetting to make reservations. The recipient is left to complete the gift or to pay part of the price in trouble or work. For example, giving an ill-fitting jewelry item or clothing which you have to pay to have altered or anything that, that's not completely suitable so you end up having to spend money and effort to make it suitable or in these days you probably re-gift it. <laughs> he doesn't mention that. Here's further examples of an uneducated heart. Making fun of your spouse in public. Breaking a promise. Insulting a debtor. Insincere kindness. Slipshod sentimentality masquerading as kindness. Now in philosophy, the, there are three main theories of ethics. There's Aristotle's virtue ethics, which uh, emphasizes the agent, the person acting. There's utilitarianism by Stuart, John Stuart Mill, who relies on the result of the action, uh, on the people that the action affects, so greatest good for greatest number. Or Kant's categorical imperative, which relies on rules. Can this action be universalized as a rule to benefit everybody? So in this case, he's emphasizing virtue ethics, which places the burden on the agent, the person acting, to act properly and, and act in a good manner. Of course, Nietzsche takes the, uh, uh, that to an extreme. You know, he's, he's focusing purely on individualism and to, with the will to power affecting the environment around you. Um, so th those are the three main theories of ethics. So he gives further examples of what educated hearts do. When you meet someone that you hadn't seen for a while, you give your name immediately. You don't say, oh, you do not remember me, do you? Uh, <laughs> or he says, Gift grifters and scammers have educated hearts because they can anticipate their victims' needs and know what their whims and tastes are. Or don't say, how about coming by next well, actually, he says you do say, how about coming by next Wednesday? Not, now do come and see me sometime. The translation is probably don't come at all. He keeps appointments on time. You don't make people wait. During conversations, you really listen, not just wait for the chance to jump in and change the subject. So he says habitual talkers probably don't have educated hearts. 
All right, another section he talks about is visiting friends in hospitals. The uneducated heart calls once or twice and brings flowers. The educated heart brings a scrapbook of recent news articles, removes barriers so the clock is visible, talks to patients instead of their better known visitors. The example is, I have to wear glasses after my eye injury. The uneducated heart says, I do hope you get those smart tortoiseshell frames. They're so becoming. This often passes for sympathy. Or to say to a partially deaf person, well, I think you get along awfully well, you know. Really, no one can hear, no one can really know you can't hear. All right, after suffering a loss, the typical reaction is, and now if there's anything I can do, be sure to let me know. Instead, do this. Live a hundred, leave a hundred dollar bill on the bed, help with household chores, and respond to messages, all without being asked. Ethics books may teach us what to do, but they don't teach us how to do it. To continue to have an educated heart, you must cultivate your imagination and have common sense. You must put yourself in another's place. Think that person's thoughts and cultivate style. So that, that's the end of his uh, book on that. But he didn't stop there. He also wrote an article called Sympathy is What You Make It, published in Reader's Digest of all places, 1942. So he calls sympathy exchanging places, putting your own feelings in relation to others. It requires wit, intelligence, and imagination. This is not pity or commiseration. In fact, he quotes Oscar Wilde, who said, Sympathy with pain is not the highest form of sympathy. Anyone can sympathize with the sufferings of a friend, but it requires a very fine nature to sympathize with a friend's success. <laughs> If a friend calls about a recent accident suffered, do not say, my brother had an accident like that, and change the subject. <laughs> when, you, when you open up to another person, don't say, how ridiculous. Say, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Don't say, it isn't so. Say, in just what way is it so? Another example is that the actor getting into a character uses a similar process. He has to really get into the mind of that character he's trying to portray. Sympathy enriches... Now, when he says sympathy here, he's really referring to empathy, but he uses the word sympathy. Enriches the agent as well as the recipient by gaining better understanding, which allows fuller sympathy, thus building on itself. By participating in another's experiences, our own experiences are amplified and understood more fully, leading to increasing harmony with fellow human beings. Now, how humanist is that? And he wrote this in 1942, you know, during World War II. So, so that concludes the prepared part of my talk. I'd be glad to answer questions. Yes. In, in order to uh, record the questions along with the answers, please wait for the microphone before asking questions. And when you have the microphone, remember to hold it close to your mouth. Please identify yourself before your question. Arthur Jackson, I have two questions. The first one is, what is the price of your book? $15. The second question, I can't remember. <laughs> That's the same price as Amazon, by the way. What's that? Oh, yeah. Yes, I did. Alfred, I remember when I was a little kid, my mom used to quote a, a line. I think I know now who the author was. The goops, they lick their fingers. The goops, they lick their knives. They spill their broth on the tablecloth and lead disgusting lives. Exactly. You, you remember that. I do. It was impressed on me. Yeah, that, that, that's one of his all right. <laughs> I'm curious as to what experience you had or how you became acquainted with this guy. I'd never, I've Heard of those, some of those limericks, you know, everybody's heard of the purple cow, I guess. But uh, how did you get involved in this? That's, and what? that's a good question. It was very serendipitously. 
I went to the auction house in Sunnyvale, uh, DG Auctions, whatever it is, forgot the name, because I collect magazines and uh, old magazines and books. So I previewed their auction. I saw a bunch of these larks as one of the lots. So I said, wow, this was done by an artist. You know, I I've, I've wrote art criticism from 1982 to 1995, so I'm able to, I think I can recognize artwork. And so I bid on it, and I won the lot. I looked him up on the internet. Uh, there's a Wikipedia article on him. So one thing led to another. And the more, the more I investigated the guy, the more compelling he seemed to me. The more I identified with him, I was sympathetic with him. You know, I'm a Unitarian as well if I had to identify a church. Um, it just felt like this, I really like this guy. You know, so I investigated further. More, the more I looked into it, the more fascinating he became. There's an archive at the UC Berkeley Bancroft Library, which is kind of ironic since they fired him. Now they have a file, they have an archive on him. <laughs> now, I haven't visited yet because they, their hours are very inconvenient, but I hope to sometime. And what I hope to find are the paintings he exhibited at the 291 gallery, Alfred Stieglitz's gallery, because I don't know where they went. I've never actually seen a real reproduction or an example of it, although I do have the reproductions from the newspaper in my book that he included in his article. So that's how I found out about him, and, it, and it's just one thing led to another. So I've been... Uh, also, another point, the publisher of this book, Suriname Turtle Press, is done by Dick Lupoff, who, the science fiction and mystery writer who lives in Berkeley. He decided to reprint all of Gillette Burgess's novels. And he wrote novels on uh, human uh, foibles, he wrote satires, he wrote two mystery novels. This guy was all over the place. Uh, and so you can, if you're interested in reading those, you can just Google Suriname Turtle Press, just order them from the publisher or, or Amazon. Fascinating character. Do you run into others who, who, who share your interest? Or? Yes, and that's another uh, good I first lectured with Dick Lupoff at the Book Club of California in San Francisco two years ago. And people who attended that knew Gillette Burgess from other areas. Like there was an interior designer who came who knew his design work, and uh, her husband knew him from other things. And it's just amazing. You know, they, another woman came by saying that her father was at Berkeley during the, the uh, 30s and 40s, and they all were part of this secret society that... Burgess was the patron of. He, he wrote these, um, uh, he co-wrote a lot of things from other, the, other people as well. The, there were two brothers that went to Stanford and that he uh, co-wrote things with. Um, yeah, so there are people that know him from other contexts and other areas. Perhaps you said earlier, but what year did he die? 1951. Okay, so he was... And he was the subject of an English PhD thesis around that time as well. So he was still very active in the 30s and the 40s. Yes, yeah. He, so. he wrote, still wrote books. He contributed to many magazines. I was trying to compile a bibliography of his magazines. Impossible. There are just so many that it would be impossible to, to uh, enumerate them all. Fascinating, man. Yes. Uh, your um, observations, uh, any uh, comparisons or contrast with someone like Mark Twain, either before or after his daughter's death, Twain? No, I would say his area was different from Mark Twain because he, he was emphasizing more humor and human foibles and, and obviously he didn't attain the stature of Mark Twain. He, he didn't write any equivalent of of uh, Tom Sawyer or Huckleberry Finn or uh, King, uh, the uh, Connecticut, uh, King Arthur in Connecticut's, King, yeah. King, Yankee, Yankee and King Arthur's Court, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's it's a different area, but uh, they, 
So it's not quite the same. But although his, his nonsense dictionary was published the same time as Andros Bierce's Devil's Dictionary, which uh, over you know, was, was much more popular than his. That's why um, he's, his is not as well known. Marion? Mike, thanks. Thank you. Hi, Marion. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering if he was popular enough in his own lifetime that a lot of people, you know, that he was pretty well known, or, and if not, was he kind of disturbed that he was a little bit of a, maybe almost ran? I mean, he was so diffuse with what he did, it seems it would be hard for him to gain much of a level of fame during his lifetime. So did that, assuming that's correct, and maybe it's not, did, yeah, yeah, did that disturb him? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know if he was disturbed, but uh, he just wrote as a very prolific writer, that's all. Um, on the other hand, uh, a lot of humorists were marginalized by the academic people. For instance, not even art historians know that he, gave, he was responsible for Picasso getting his first show in this country. I doubt very many art historians know that. But because he was a humorist, he wasn't published in one of the major art magazines of the time. He had to publish in the architectural record, which is a little different. But uh, that, that may be true, because he did write in so many genres that just spread himself real thin. Do you think that now he might enjoy a posthumous uh, rebirth of interest and popularity? That's what I'm trying to promote. <laughs> <laughs> and if you click on eBay and click on his name, his books and reprints are selling, and some of them are increasing in price. Um, and Dick Lupoff certainly is trying that as well by reprinting all his books. So I approached him to publish this, and he was encouraging and helped me a lot to get this published. So there, there is a small effort to get him more recognition now. I think he should be recognized more for, for what he did. Uh, Albert, yeah, this is Alex. I, was, uh, I noticed you mentioned the, the poem, The Spider, or the story. Was he a fan of, of horror or, or grotesque oh, stories? Oh, you mean Burgess? Or? Yes. No, no, in fact, he was trying to react against that. Uh, I see. He thought that the decadents were too morbid. That was his word. But he was won over by the, the, the strange art. Y yeah, yeah, that's right. 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 Hi, this is Chris. Um, I like your description of the uneducated heart. I think uh, manners, you know, people are kind of falling away from, you know, conventional manners. And I really like the description of how one can really be sincere and be, be interesting to have that as just a sort of a subgenre or something as a way to comport yourself, you know, in society. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, if there are no more questions, then let's thank our speaker. Thanks for your attention.